handing over a statement of former President Kaba of Sierra Leone on Inauguration Day on November the 5th, 2007. Mr. President, this is a unique and momentous occasion in the history of our country, as it is for the first time that a constitutionally elected government is handing over authority to a constitutionally elected successor. I would like at this outset to congratulate you on behalf of my outgoing government and on my own personal behalf on your election to the highest office of the land. And I wish you every success in your tenure of office as President of the Republic of Sierra Leone. My statement today should be regarded as a form of handing over report. I have taken note with full agreement of your desire that outgoing ministers of my government present to your proper handing over reports. I am pleased to learn that the process went through satisfactorily. Consequently, my suggestions and recommendations should be properly interpreted as, as arising out of my experience as president of our country. Today, you are inheriting a state that is on a threshold of taking off for the process and progress and prosperity that lied for our people. Since the war came to an end, the security of the state has been maintained through the reconstructing of the security sector and with the assistance of the United Kingdom government and improvements in the conditions of services for the security forces. Local government authority has been restored. A more effective justice system has been gradually built. A more proactive stance and increased vigilancy from responsible civil society groups and satisfactorily informed general public is increasingly contributing to the building of a more transparent and accountable society. Many projects have been put in place to create jobs, particularly for unemployed youth. I understand that you have visited the Bumbuna Hydroelectric Project and have seen the state of progress for yourself. In the meantime, measures to further improve the electricity situation in the capital city are currently in the progress with the help of the Moroccan technical team. Schools have been rebuilt, hospitals refurnished, a new one under construction. New diagnostic equipment has been installed that is now significantly reduced the need for the people to travel abroad for medical attention. With regards to road, as soon as the war ended, my government assiduously went back on the tax of repairing and restoring the road network with the help of the Kuwait Fund, World Bank, Africa Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank and the European Union. The polar walls have either been constructed or are under construction. The Korobondo Blama, Jendama Ferry Road in the south, Makini Kakawi Road in the north, Korobondo Kabala Axis and the Mashaka Makini Road also in the north. Work is in the progress on several other roads such as the Mashaka Bo Road mainly in the south and the Tonkolili Lumbe Road in the western area whereby completing the Waterloo Freetown slash Peninsula Road. Funding has been secured for several planned road projects such as the Bo Kenema Road, Kenema Kwedu Road, Makini Matuna Road, Matoko Kwedu Road, Wubaru Junction, Panda Road, the Songo Moyamba Road, and the Moyamba Moyamba Junction Road. With regards to the hillside bypass road that will run behind Pandemba Road Prison and exit behind Kisi Road Cemetery, the delay is starting. This project has been too long with the procrastination negotiations with the property owners. 
We also have funding for the construction of 1,150 kilometers of feeder roads throughout the provinces as an integral part of our food security program. Further, I strongly recommend to you, Mr. President, to pay particular attention to Kenema Kwede Road, for which funding is secured from our Arab countries and OPEC, and tender documents are under preparation. The Kenema Kwede Road deserves special mention. Apart from its strate strategic and security importance, the Kodu market came into existence in 1932, the year in which I was born. That is over 75 years ago. It was an initiative of the people who live in that area bordering Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. It's developed into a full-scale international market attracting traders from as far as Ivory Coast. It will not be extragraduates to the states that it was the precursors of our Mano River Union today, which only came into existence in 1975. Two years ago, Parliament leaders, prominent citizens on either side of the Moa and Makona River, formed the Makona River Union. Its second general assembly in Kwedu was graced by the heads of states of three countries. At the summit resolutions was presented at the assembly to further considerate the union. In addition to the international market in Kwedu, technical slash vocational institutes and general referee hospitals in the Fuya, Kama in Liberia and Nongoya in Guinea, respectively, are recommended. The National Security for Social Action has already allocated seed money for the construction of a modern international market in Kwedu. Your Excellency may wish to pursue this matter further with, the, with your colleagues, especially for your recent interaction with them. Let me also add that the feasibility studies for the Freetown Lungi Link Road, the Lungi Potloko Road, and the Bandama Manon River Bridge Road have been completed and is now urgent to secure funding for their construction. Perhaps you may want to consider the involvement of the private sector for the early constructions of the Freetown Lungi Link Road in the context of a toll system arrangement. Mr. President, all of this is a far cry from what we inherited when we came into office in 1986. We took over from a military regime at a time when the brutal war was still raging. So followed up a coup by the armed forces revolutionary council, which eventually brought the economy to a shambles. The country's bankrupt and basic infrastructure completely destroyed. My government inherited a debt of about $1.6 billion with strengthening financial practices. Today we enjoy a debt relief in over $500 billion. At the Central Bank, for use by your government. My government, therefore, the roads and responsibilities of a president in a country that is just emerging from a conflict are enormous and particularly challenging. Throughout my presidency, I was guided by four major principles. 1. Seek the interest of the state. 2. Secure the welfare of the people. 3. Create opportunities to enable the people to realize their potential. And 4. To build a national cohesion. You may wish to consider these principles in formulating your program here for moving our country forward. In a diverse society such as ours, with many ethnic and other groups, rich and poor, educated and illiterate, the greatest challenge is how to bring about national cohesion so that everyone in his or her own little way can contribute to the development of the state. 
though my tenure of office that I endeavor is to make my government as exclusive as possible so that every sector could have a strike in the security of the state. At the time, for the sake of peace, I included former rebels who had been waging war on the state and killing our people. We are emerging from a battleist contested election that threatens the very essence of our state with confrontations, intima intimidations and harassment among party supporters. One of your biggest challenges will be how to reconcile all of these opposing groups and heal whatever frictions and misunderstandings that may have been created by electoral progress. On the score, I hereby openly declare my willingness to offer you any assistance you may need because the peace and cohesion of this country have always been among my principal objectives. The security forces we are highly acclaimed for their impartial and professionalism during the elections, but there have been recent allegations, particularly with reference to the police, about not being even handed. All the efforts must be made to remove such doubts. These outstanding needs, I'm still proud of our police, as they have many good and committed officers. We enjoy the military to continue as well organized, disciplined and professional entity. I have no doubt that they have the capacity to safeguard and the integrity of the state and to protect the life and property of its citizens. Mr. President, I am amazed to read in our press that my government was soft on corruption and that our development partners may have withheld funding because of this. Let me state that my government maintained a very robust stand against corruption. Before I assumed office, corruption was a taboo subject in this country. It was so epidemic that the word corruption was never used. I personally led this fight against corruption, and this process I requested and obtained assistance from the British. The British consulate, consulate designed the Anti-Corruption Commission strategy based on the model he made put in place with excellent results in Hong Kong and Botswana. At the inception of our own Anti-Corruption Commission, we were able to prosecute and convict high-profile of officials among whom we are appeal court judge, ministers, and other senior officials. The Anti-Corruption Commission sensitive the continues to sensitize the civilian public about the evils of corruption through the very effective means of communication, through radio and TV messages. I personally have refer to corruption in my address to parliaments as a national security threat. I have refused to do so, to play the counterproductive game of the politics of anti-corruption, by which the fight against corruption is misused as a political weapon against one's political opponents. I may add here that certain strong positions taken by our international partners may have been counterproductive in the fight against corruption. For example, the FID insists that we change the prosecution's process of corruption cases by removing the Antony General flight to determine who should be prosecuted and reenacted this function to a team of three prosecutors, two of whom are either appointees and the third a nominee of the Antony General. This was a constraint to the provisions of our constitution. The threatening to withdraw the financial assistance unless we agree to their prescriptions, even though they were informed that the Antony General's fate 
was an entrenched clause in our constitution. Held into pressure, a high profile case was taken to court, presided over to the FID, recruited charges. The case was thrown out of court for the very reason that my government had given. Even the DFID has maintained its stand. Making the Auditor General reports available to an international agency before it had gone through Parliament scrutiny as required by our laws was another area of difficulty. Even the President is not entitled to these documents until after Parliament after parliamentary scrutiny. Our government could not tolerate, even from a friendly country, the use of financial leverage to undermine our sovereignty. A further concern was the high-handed manner in which the Deputy Anti-Corruption Commissioner, DFID appointee, treated civil unions suspected of corruption. One case was down reeled on the residence of a minister without a search warrant or an arrest warrant. The ministers were detained for a whole day in pageant in the ACC's office, although no corruption evidence was produced. To see yet another disagreement was the treatment the Deputy Attorney General Commissioner meted against the civil union. Ms. Newsman Smart who has decided to return home from the United Kingdom where she practiced law, she served her country. Ms. Newman Smart was employed by government as chief immigration officer. She was arrested. Her premise, the, her premise research and her personal papers put on internet, thereby depriving her of her privacy. This harassment and shock may have led to the lady's premature death as she was hypotensively case. But government took the view that prosecutions was not only the way to fight corruption. While successful prosecutions could indeed be a strong deterrent against corruption, its impact, its impact on the abolition to it can be minimal minimal with the effort in the motion to maintain legislative and administrative measures to remove the opportunities for corruption which I could like to recommend to you mr. president for your consideration one procurement leakages if not properly sealed can lead to a high rate of corruption we therefore enact legislations which remove the procurement from government ministers to a commissioner comprising people of high integrated and knowledgeable of procurement matters. 2. The National Policy Adversary Committee was set up to advise the cabinet of all sector policies and the cabinet papers make recommendations for government actions. The NPAC is composed of highly satisfied, qualified and reliable civil union who scrutinies uh, all papers to ensure they are in the best interest of the state. The past chairman of the NPAC have been Dr. P. L. Talker, Professor Eldwell Jones, Dr. Dunstan Spencer and correctly Professor John Camara. 3. Public Expenditure Tracking Surveys. System is designed to ensure that goods and services which the intended benefactories and are not scaffolded away along the road. Hilary Beeney, the Secretary of the States for DFID, commended my government on this particular initiative while he was addressing an international meeting in the United Kingdom. Fourth, budgeting process in most countries is not known to anyone except the minister, the Ministry of Finance officials. Other people only get details on the day. 
the budget is read in Parliament. Today in Sierra Leone, the budgetary process is transparent and particularly as civil society, Parliament chiefs and students are invited to take part in the budget process. Mr. President, for anyone therefore to say that my government was soft on corruption, it is to stop the fact that our reports stand against corruption, against the social economic scaffold. Before I conclude, I want to mention a number of situations in which my opinion could preoccupy my mind, your mind, as you conduct the farewell of your state. Let our people know that unless they can provide enough food for their own consumptions and surpluses for export, as we used for, to do that before, the advent of diamonds, we shall never be truly independent. I did my own bit under my food security programming, even if some people still claim to go to bed hungry. Nobody can claim not to have been sensitized about the need to be self-sufficient in food production, including the diversifications of our diet. So, encouraging our people to work hard for what they want and not depend on others. The state, the government, or even donors to provide for all their needs Sierra Leone should not seem as a nanny state or a Cumbra state. 3. Keep a wasteful eye over the mineral resources and to ensure that they are, ex they are not exploited for the maximum benefits of the ordinary people. In this connection, we have already taken measures to uh, um, develop a database of our mineral resources what kind where they are located quantity and their quality if this is completed the country will be in a stronger position to negotiate the best time for the exploitations Sierra Leone is now a member of the extractive industrial transparency initiative the EITI which should help us in instilling transparency in revenue deprived from our minerals and the way which revenues is used. Fifth, guard against environmental degradation so that we do not lose our forest and animals, especially weird and endeavored species, which are indigenous to our country. 5. Condemnation, the thinking that as a nation, our output is dependent upon the skills, competence, and the training of our young resources, of our human resources. My government opened the way for many people to access quality education. Reviewing the 36334 three, system of education should not be the misconstructed or dampens the gain we have so obviously made. You may wish to consider taking steps to expand this space by continuing to create affordable affordable institutions to allow Sierra Leoneans of various abilities and capacities to feel proud of their attainments as they continue the nation building. Six and discipline and lawlessness have been the ban of our society. Every effort should be made to corrupt these malice. The criminal justice systems and the police should do everything possible to bring culprits and lawbreakers to book. I am heartened by your commitment to this call, as stated in your sharing in addressing and I have no doubt that you have and you will succeed. Mr. President, I want to wish I want to wish you and I also want to thank you and to thank all those who worked 
with me in my administration. For the successes we achieved while in office. With, with this remark, I have hand over to you, Mr. President, the baton of office and once again wish you very well and every success during your tenure of office. And I take my leave to enjoy a well-earned retirement. I thank you all for your attention.